On this edition of The Best Times, we asked the question, do people get happier as they age? You'll meet the gifted artist, Mary Norman, and we'll remember the devastating record flood of 1937. Funding for the Best Times is provided by... Since 1988, the H.W. Durham Foundation has been focused on aging issues, providing grants to programs like the Best Times to enrich and improve the quality of life for our older citizens. The Best Times is the only monthly news magazine exclusively for the age 50 plus reader. Your copy is free at over 200 locations with important stories and news you don't want to miss. The Best Times is always the best. Trezevant, a life care community, a celebration of life. The responsible decision for your well-being now and in the long term. And being responsible has never been such a hoot. TrezevantManor.org Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. It was Thomas Jefferson who penned the words, pursuit of happiness. You'd be hard pressed to find the concept of happiness mentioned in any other political treatise, especially one so rebellious in its nature as our own Declaration of Independence. Thankfully, Jefferson didn't try to define happiness for Americans, that's up to us. Are you happy? There's a surprising body of research that points to the conclusion that people actually get happier as they get older. Maybe it takes a lifetime pursuing happiness to finally catch up with it. Are you happier now than when you were younger and why or why not? Oh, I'm happier now, but uh, probably because I'm a little older and a little wiser. I'm happy now because I'm enjoying life. Oh, I'm, I think I'm happier now. I've got grandchildren, I'm retired, I can play with them, and uh, yeah, life is good. I'm happier now in a different way because now I know where I am and where I'm going, whereas when I was younger I wasn't sure and I was searching. But I'm very content and very happy. I had a very happy childhood, but I will say I'm probably as happy now. No, I was probably happier when I was younger, had better health. I'm more content. I'm not trying to achieve anymore, I'm enjoying what I have. Oftentimes when we're younger, we're doing things maybe that we have to do or we feel like we need to do, but now I can do what I want to do and I love it. I've learned a lot and I know how to be happy. It's not about material things, but it's about having the relationships with your family and your friends, and that's what makes me happy. The Stanford Center on Longevity identifies what they call the paradox of aging. The recognition that we won't live forever changes our perspective on life in positive, not negative ways. To find out more about the link between aging and happiness, I invited two guests into our studio. Sarah Prosser is the Administrative Assistant for the Professional Network on Aging, and Dr. Richard Leitze is Associate Professor of Counseling Psychology at the University of Memphis. I want to begin by asking the two of you the same question that I asked those people at the Germantown Senior Expo. Are you happier now than when you were younger and why or why not? Sarah, let's start with you. Well, I believe I'm happier now because there's less stress about um, peer pressure. If, if you are smart when you're younger to try to um, save money and be prepared for your retirement, then your retirement should be uh, pleasant and enjoyable with your friends and uh, making your own plans and doing as you please. So you're happier now? I think I am. All right, Dr. Lightsey, how about you? Definitely, in fact, I've noticed every decade I've been happier than the previous decade. That's interesting, why? 
I think this mirrors the literature quite nicely in that I have better social relations, deeper friendships than I have. I allocate my time better than I used to, I think, doing the things I most enjoy and that give me the most meaning. Um, I've met many of the goals that I set for myself and for others that I haven't yet reached, like writing the great American novel, <laughs> I've kind of toned it down a bit, you know, to writing scholarly products that contribute to knowledge in the field and maybe an occasional creative essay that I've yet to get to. Is it just life experience that we're better at life now as we get older that makes us happier as we age? What are your thoughts? Maybe your expectations are different too. Expectations? <coughs> it's, what role do you feel expectations play? Well, you know, you have a utopia in the beginning thinking everything's Oh, it's just going to be way, way high, but realistic. We've learned to live more realistically, that everything is not up here, and you learn to live with this, this perimeter, perhaps. What does science say about expectations? <laughs> what does psychology say? Expectations are important, uh, and calibrating your expectations to reality and what you actually may get is also important. There's quite a bit of evidence that older adults relative to younger adults are less sensitive to negative life events, sad and disturbing music, um, other kinds of negative stimulation. And so young people react much more strongly. And it's been theorized, in fact, and there's at least, uh, there are at least a couple of studies supporting it, that decrease in amygdala functioning might to some degree account for the lower negative affect that older people have compared to younger people. I don't think that explains all of it though because older adults also have more positive emotion and life satisfaction than younger adults. Does our definition of happiness change as we age? Has it changed for you? I just think we learn the important things um, perhaps when we're younger, we go in lots of different directions, not knowing. But once we know ourselves and know what brings our joy, joy comes from within and happiness are for outer things. And as you grow older, you still, if you're active, you're still doing lots of things. But, but the happiness, you, you don't go hill to skelter. You, you sort of um, have a plan and... Uh, not having a timetable on doing certain things, you can do more of what you want when you want to do it. Older people experience less intense or calmer positive feelings. And looking in myself, I think the happiness that I feel now is a calmer sort of happiness than maybe I felt at peak moments in, in younger life. Is it the fact that we, we all mellow out as we age? The yeah. highs aren't as high, the lows aren't as low? I think that's one way of saying it. Yeah, I think that's... Correct. Let's talk about, <clears throat> about health and the role that it plays in this equation of happiness we age. What, uh, what factor does health play? My little theory <laughs> goes back to how you were when you were 20s, when you were when you're 80. If you were happy then, you're happy now, even with bad illnesses. Health is a strong predictor of happiness. Um, healthier people tend to be happier. Um, but it's also true uh, among older people that even though they report bigger discrepancies compared to younger people in the health they want to have, that is health aspirations versus the health they actually have, they're still happier. And possibly that's because they've achieved their goals or have downgraded their goals. There's less of a discrepancy between the social and achievement related goals they had and the ones that they've accomplished. And so, um, but it does look like if you look across people that older people can maintain higher happiness despite health problems. And I believe, although I don't know of evidence about that, that some of that is about acceptance of things, uh, acceptance of mortality, um, acceptance of limitations, um, and just seeing that as a natural part of life uh, and compensating by finding other things that give joy as capacities in particular realms diminish. Are there, are there keys to <laughs> happiness? Do you feel like there are certain things that you can check off? If I do A, B, C, D, I'll be happy? 
I wanted to share these little things that sure. I heard the other day. Um, it was uh, something of what we're talking about now, and the, the title was Growing Old Graciously, which fits so well with what we were talking about. And number one was be sure that we're right with God. And number two is maintain that positive attitude. And we were just mentioning that. And maintain a sense of humor. You know, we seniors need to have our humor. Uh, take care of your physical health. And then the spirit of thanksgiving and gratitude. I really like that. And in fact, um, <coughs> gratitude, uh, there's studies in progress showing, and there's a literature showing that learning to be grateful for things does predict more happiness. I, I had read uh, this statement, which I'll paraphrase, but basically it is, uh, says that happiness is a journey, not a destination. What do you think about that? That's good. I like that. Do you find that true in your own life? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Reminds me of the flow literature showing that insofar as we can immerse ourselves in the stream of experience and be here and now, and there is evidence that older adults are more here and now than younger adults, and that that partly accounts for their increased happiness. Um, but yeah, I think the idea of being able to flow with experience and of happiness being a process of learning to immerse yourself in the here and now and the activities that you value and that give meaning uh, is very important. I'd like to thank both of you for being on The Best Times and, and I wish both of you a very happy day. Oh, thank, thank you. you. They say that art imitates life, but ask an artist and they'll tell you that life, their life, often dictates the content and scope of the art they produce. Such is the story of Mary Norman, whose art show here at WKNO's Gallery 1091 is somewhat of a comeback story for one of the most gifted painters in Memphis. Take a look at this portrait of Mary Norman. drew and I was an only child and I just always drew to entertain myself. In school, you know, still living at home when I was a kid, uh, my dad got me a little easel and I set it up in my bedroom and I went to bed with the smell of oil paint and turpentine and woke up to it. Uh, that's just, that's just, that was, I, you know, uh, I couldn't put it down. I couldn't wait to get home from school so I could paint some more. Mary Norman's passion for painting has been a driving force in her life. But oddly, she took a 12-year break from the canvas and the work that she loved. More about that in a moment. Take a look at some of Mary's pieces from the 80s and 90s, and you'll see the delicate craftsmanship of a largely self-taught artist whose early work was inspired by a trip to the Tate Gallery in London to see a Salvador Dali retrospective. And I was just amazed at his surfaces. The detail on the surfaces were just so incredibly beautiful. And when I came home, I just started <laughs> trying to paint like that as much as possible. Um, not a lot of heavy brush strokes, just pretty much no texture. They were almost like glass, um, and yet so highly detailed. So I kind of, I kind of taught myself that, uh, just you know, trial and error over the years. A lot of my paintings were very surreal and kind of quirky and dark and strange um, things that I had. Uh, images came from dreams a lot. This is arguably Mary's most recognizable work, the 1992 Memphis in May poster saluting Italy. It shined a spotlight on her talent. The Memphis in May poster was a commission, so I did try very hard to please everybody and not sacrifice, you know, not do something I didn't like, but um, that's why there's a lot of things packed into that. There were little hidden things and little things that weren't um, really obvious, you know, people were finding lines to, to uh, classical music 
and the postmodern chair and all kinds of other little things. So it was kind of almost like a puzzle. So it, it yes, it went over, it went over pretty well. Her work has been shown in galleries throughout the country, and she sold every painting she's finished. I made a living at at art. I was really organized, and I devoted all my time to it for a long time. Um, and then I I had my only child when I was 45. Sometimes life gets in the way of art. Her only son, Robert, was born, and then her father had a stroke. And then came her diagnosis. I, I had a little bit of ovarian cancer, and it just turned out to be a kind that was not terribly aggressive. It makes you think what is really important in life and, you know, makes you reprioritize. And I knew immediately, without any question, that obviously my son was, was my first priority, but that I did want to get back to art someday. But um, it just wasn't time yet. Mary took a 12-year hiatus from painting. Life got in the way. I would get something ready to paint on, and I would try to sketch, and I just couldn't make myself sketch. Um, so it just, yeah, it went away for, for a really long time. I sort of missed it, but I occupied myself with other things. This year, Mary has returned to painting. She's prepping for a show at our own Gallery 1091 at the WKNO Studios. She calls the show a minute and a half of summer, inspired by the photographs she took on two vacations to New England. The paintings are about the same size as the photos she's working from, and they have an unusual canvas. I've got so many little projects going on around this fixer-upper house um, that I just had some scraps of wood, and I happened to have one just about the right size, so I put some gesso on it and and uh, did the first painting, and as I say, it came about so easily, and it was just, that little chunk of wood was so nice to hold, it was just really nice to handle. So um, these paintings were, are, are much more straightforward and, and kind of simple, just, just you know, sunsets and, you know, beach scenes and uh, close-ups of, of lanterns and interesting things that I find. It's just, it's just I hate to say easy, but but I'm not going to stress about it. I mean, this, it's been 12 years since I've painted, and if I feel like painting a pretty tree <laughs> or a nice sunset, I'm not going to feel guilty about it. Because I think, you know, having gone to, you know, art classes in college, they, you know, they say that pretty isn't art, and, you know, it's, it's got to be more important than that. And that's all very true, but um, I just was putting too many limits on myself, uh, too many limits on, on what I thought I should allow myself to do and I've just kind of thrown all that away. The physical aspect of aging and just what I've gone through in life, um, they all point to the same place, which is just don't stress about the details that much. Just kind of, kind of, you know, do your best. If it looks good, be happy with that, and don't try to change it. I, I've always felt that an artist, a true artist, is somebody who's in a position to really do something good for the world. And that's not to say we're, oh, we're so important and, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I've got all the answers, but, but there are problems. And if you can help people look at their problems and, and just have some hope that there's a way out, uh, you know, that's, that's, I think that's good work. Some of you watching will remember January of 1937 when the rains came and didn't stop until parts of 31 states were underwater. Here, the Mississippi River crested at over 48 feet, a record that still stands today. Memphis became an island of refuge for tens of thousands left homeless by the flooding. Historian Patrick O'Daniel records the human drama in his book, Memphis and the Superflood of 1937. Tremendous rainstorms hit the Ohio and Mississippi valleys uh, January 1st in 1937 and it caused tremendous flooding in both valleys at the same time. Uh, cities like uh, Cincinnati and Louisville completely flooded and had to be evacuated. Flooding stretched all along the Ohio and Mississippi valleys from West Virginia to Louisiana. More than 21 inches of rain fell in January of 1937 
and over 8 million acres of land were underwater, creating what one newspaper called a lake the size of Ireland. One and a half million people were affected by this disaster, and Memphis became a refuge for thousands. At one point in February of 37, one in five people in Memphis was a refugee. So we had between 50 and 60,000 refugees come through Memphis in about a month period. One family in particular I can think of that the floor, water came up through the floorboards. The husband runs out, hooks up the uh, mules to the wagon, gets his wife, gets his kids out in there. And by this point, the water's up to the wheels. They get about a mile down the road and the hooves of the uh, mules are no longer touching the ground. The wheels aren't touching the ground either. And the only thing that keeps them from sinking below the waves is the momentum of the mules swimming towards the levee. People got out with basically their clothes on their backs. Now, a lot of them traveled to Memphis on foot. So they're cold, wet, and of course sick. So once they got to Memphis, they had to be quarantined. The first thing the city did was to close down the fairgrounds and use the fairgrounds amusement park as a refugee camp. National Guardsmen came in and other volunteers built additional barracks to house the refugees that were coming in. And there were over a thousand of them coming in a day. Once the uh, uh, fairgrounds filled to capacity, the city shut down all the schools um, and all the schools were used as hospitals. 8,000 refugees were hospitalized and cared for by the Red Cross and volunteers from the Memphis medical community. Even by today's standards, it's amazing how quickly and efficiently the city was able to act in this crisis, and how generously people opened up their hearts and their wallets. When people would give money, the donations were listed in the, in the newspaper, in the commercial appeal, the name and how much money they gave. And you saw so people like Boss Crump or some, some big business owners give you know, large amounts of money. But you go down the list all the way to the end, and there are children giving change to help out. And it's remarkable how much money was raised, not just locally, but across the whole country for this. Keep in mind, this is 1937. This is the depths of the Depression. And people were still giving everything they possibly could. And it took almost no time at all for them to organize and get started. In spite of the generosity of Memphians, life in the camps wasn't comfortable. The buildings that were used to house the refugees weren't really made for housing refugees. I mean, the cattle barn was not a place for people. The automobile building wasn't really a place for people. But volunteers from the Red Cross and Memphians who came in to help out did the best they could. Uh, the city provided entertainment. Uh, there were different uh, musical acts that came through. At one point, a circus came through to entertain the kids. Church groups came in, people sang songs, watched movies, things like that. But Memphians did what they could to uh, make the refugees as comfortable as possible. In the midst of this disaster, E.H. Crump took issue with the way Mayor Watkins Overton was handling the recovery. So the boss took charge. Crump personally led uh, uh, flood control efforts on the non Connor Creek. So he'd stayed out there night and day, you know, directing people, say, here, take the steam shovel over there, you guys move sandbags over there, you know, he took it upon himself to do it. And yes, that did cause friction with the mayor, because the mayor was saying, hey, we've already taken care of this, you really don't need to be doing this. So there were some problems there. It's like, well, who's really running the city? And by the end of the flood, it was plainly clear that it was Boss Crump. Two years later, Crump was elected mayor for the third time. He was sworn in, promptly resigned, and turned the reins over to his protege, Walter Chandler. On February 18th, the flooding ended, and the storm-weary refugees slowly began to return to what was left of their homes. The exact number of flood-related deaths remains unclear, but the flood left over $3 billion of damage in its wake prompting the federal government to beef up flood control along the Ohio River and in Memphis. When the Mississippi River began to rise again in 2011 to near record levels, the flood control measures held the waters in check. But as Patrick O'Daniel notes, we have an uneasy truce with Old Man River. We know that we've developed these areas that used to be runoff for the Mississippi River, all these swamplands and stuff like that that used to absorb all the floods. 
Well, the river doesn't know that. So we basically had this uh, very uh, loose truce with the river. And the river will come back and claim that land and admit it often does. I hope you'll join me next week for more of the best times. Until then, please visit our website where you can watch past shows and get more information about life after 50. And while you're online, email us your comments and story ideas. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Hardaway. Good night. Funding for the best times is provided by Trezevant, a life care community, a celebration of life. The responsible decision for your well-being now and in the long term. And being responsible has never been such a hoot. TrezevantManor.org The Best Times is the only monthly news magazine exclusively for the age 50 plus reader. Your copy is free at over 200 locations with important stories and news you don't want to miss. The Best Times is always the best. Since 1988, the H.W. Durham Foundation has been focused on aging issues, providing grants to programs like The Best Times to enrich and improve the quality of life for our older citizens.